Good afternoon, folks. Uh, good to be here at the Web Science Trust. I appreciate the effort, and I very much appreciate the theme of observatories, of tools for observation. Um, that mission and vision aligns very closely with the goals of the Social Media Research Foundation, an organization I founded with a large group of others after departing Microsoft after about a decade there. Uh, I founded an organization with people like Ben Schneiderman at the University of Maryland and Microsoft employees like Natasha millish frailing from the Cambridge, Cambridge England lab, uh, and a number of scholars from around the world. And our goal is embodied in our motto. Uh, you may see it here on your screen, and I'll be showing you some slides where that will be a prominent theme. Open tools, open data, open scholarship for social media. And so I'm going to try in the next hour to demonstrate that we have made some efforts and contributions on all three of those fronts. We would like there to be free and open tools that simplify the process of doing uh, not just uh, social media research, but uh, network research broadly, but we do have a focus. We are interested in the mapping and documentation of the landscape of social media. And so one way to enable that is to build a tool that, that captures many of the techniques and methods of what is now data science or big data or uh, many of the terms that are being used to uh, describe the get a large blob of data and squeeze some meaning from it by applying a variety of mathematical and information visualization techniques. Right now, that's a wonderful and fertile landscape if you are a software developer. And I'm finding that there are many scholars who are unlikely in this lifetime anyway, to master Python and MySQL, who are not going to really be able to control Hadoop or D3 or you know JavaScript. The list goes on. Uh, I am very impressed by my colleagues who are capable in this way, and I have several of them. They are the coding sociologists, uh, remarkable people. But we're interested in walking a certain path, uh, a path followed, let's say, by desktop publishing, where you take very complicated skills and you embody them in code. And you broaden the potential population of people who can practice those skills. And so what we have done, and uh, allow me to get the slides up here, is worked on a tool that makes doing uh, social media research as easy as making a pie chart. Here are some of our contributors. Some of them are in Britain, uh, quite a few of them, actually. Um, and what I think makes us somewhat unique is that we have mixed the computer scientists with the social scientists, the information scientists, the anthropologists, the political scientists, uh, many of the needs of the researchers have been put above the needs of the software developers, or we, we've been lucky to find software developers who think that user interface design, user experience is a really good thing, and I would argue that our tool, Node Excel, is innovative not because we are the greatest scale or most powerful or most, most esoteric network tool, uh, but that we are the easiest, and that's our goal. So uh, how to do that? Well, our goal is to be like a free and open browser like Firefox. What Firefox is to HTML, we seek to be for GraphML. Uh, GraphML, of course, is an ML, uh, like a markup language, an XML file format. But if you Google it, you come to graphdrawing.org, and you find that it's a very simple, straightforward way of expressing uh, information about a population and the relationships among the members of that population. So we want to be to GraphML what Firefox is to HTML. Free, open, easy to use, and something that would allow many, many researchers 
to collectively assemble uh, a series of snapshots, if you will, uh, a composite picture of the landscape of social media. So we have built this tool. It's called Node Excel, and I'm sure we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it today. Uh, Node Excel stands for the Network Overview, Discovery, and Exploration uh, uh, Analysis Tool for Excel. It's an acronym, and it plugs into most of the recent versions of Excel so long as you're on Windows, and we apologize to the Mac users. I'm a Mac user, but uh, there is a way around it for the Mac users. Uh, it involves virtual machines, but for the moment, we're running on the Windows platform in Office, and 2007, 2010, and 2013 all work. And we have a release coming out now that will be uh, bringing us up to compatibility with all the Windows 8 stuff. So we're, we're going to be a brand new application in the next week or so. Uh, so part of our goal is also to not only build a tool and get it out into a population, but to facilitate users of that tool collectively generating an archive. And I'll direct your attention to the website nodexlgraph.com gallery.org. Uh, I like to say that it is a kind of flicker for network data sets. You get a picture, you get a description, and at the bottom you get a link. And that link, actually you get three links, but uh, these links actually take you to the data. You can have, if the user has decided to, uh, to download the, uh, the data that was uploaded by other users. So we're trying to socialize expertise here. We're facilitating data sharing, and we're also demonstrating the wide range of variation in graph styles, qualities. Uh, in fact, if you go to our site now, I think you'll see we have a contingent of users who really approach this not from an analytic uh, perspective uh, as a scientific tool, but really as an aesthetic uh, perspective. They they're looking to use the tool to create uh, really beautiful images, and I find them impressive, and they push the tool in a very different direction than the uh, social scientists would. So a uh, third of our goals, open scholarship, uh, the goal is to make a contribution really to two communities of research. Uh, one, the computer scientists in our team are making contributions to the UI UX, uh, information visualization communities. We think we have innovated in ways of doing things automatically with networks that get the end result above this minimum threshold that we call good enough. Uh, we think that there's a, a, a trade-off to be made. Uh, if you can get the human out of the loop, you, you, often you can tolerate uh, imperfect graphs if they're good enough. Uh, so here you see some of our work on this idea of the group in a box layout for multifaceted analysis of communities. Takes uh, the image on the left, a traditional force directed layout of a clustered network, uh, and it essentially chops it into clusters and, and then lays on how much you like Japanese food. Uh, um, the second track, though, and, and then we have a few other innovations. I'll try to show you a, a, a few. But so we do try to make a contribution to the technical side of this community. Point you uh, most recently to the work that we've done with Pew Internet, uh, and you can find them at pewinternet.org, where we've used this tool to actually come up with a classification of the range of network structures visible in systems like Twitter, and I'll talk to that point later in this talk today. So um, broadly, social media is pretty much always going to be from people to people, and the beautiful thing about social media is that now a few billion people are participating, and it is a very naturally occurring data set that represents communication behaviors from people to people. And of course, the behavior as it is performed is being born digital. It, it's starting off in a machine readable format, and it gives us this great opportunity to study the collective set 
of signs and inscription that left behind, all these markings of interaction. Uh, every time I click or tap or drag or drop, uh, typically I'm not just interacting with a computer, I'm actually interacting uh, with another person through a computer. And of course, silicon is a, a remarkable um, substance. Here it is in a raw form. That's the Pacific Ocean, not far from my house. And um, if you turn this into a CPU, it, it becomes even better at this uh, recording process. So here on the beach in 12 hours, the tide will come in and wash this away. But in Google servers, there's a really good chance that uh, your data is going to outlive you and perhaps um, the heat death of the universe. So. Uh, the thing to note is that all of this social media behavior, all of these internet verbs, are essentially encoding different kinds of ties. There are many kinds of ties. Uh, all of these behaviors essentially describe the creation of an edge, a link, a connection between one person and another person, or potentially indirectly from a person to an object and indirectly to the creator of that object. And so it is true that not all of these ties are strong ties. And in fact, the internet has been criticized as being a landscape of shallow relationships uh, in which we could call uh, complete strangers friends. Uh, that, that I think there is some validity to that critique, but I would argue, um, or at least my question would be, who said that they were friends? Uh, I think Mark Zuckerberg said that they were friends, but if we were using a different system, we might call them contacts or connections. Uh, and then we might not be so critical of them. Uh, the sociologist Barry Wellman has noted that the internet has not significantly increased the set of strong ties that most people have. It's still about 8 to 10 to 12 people, or as he likes to put it, the number of people that you can seat comfortably around the uh, dining room table when you add the leaf back in. Uh, but it has changed the number of weak ties that we have, in some cases amplifying them by an order of magnitude, the people that you kind of sort of know, the people that you meet at conferences, the people whose names are on your Facebook friend list but that you probably couldn't pick out of a crowd. Uh, these are the weak ties, and it's true that weak ties are, well, weak, but in sociology, it, it's worth noting that there is the single most cited paper, I think, in our literature, and that is the work of Mark Granovetter, uh, not far from where I stand, uh, at Stanford University. He wrote the paper in 1972, 73, I think, that suggests that in aggregate, these weakly connected people are incredibly valuable. Um, that this was, for example, where new jobs came from, from people you knew a little bit who knew a lot of things about distant social worlds. So what we're looking to do now is get information about the nature of these ties. Are they strong? Are they weak? How many are there? How many times does A link to B? Uh, and it's worth noting that not all of these ties or edges are uh, equal. Uh, it, it may not be the case that if A is linked to B, that B is also linked to A. Uh, sometimes it is the case that if A links to B, B is linked to A, but it doesn't have to be the case. Uh, in some cases, there are relationships where it's essentially mutual. Um, so giving rides to airport, that's a relationship that tends to only flow in one direction, whereas is married to is a relationship that uh, almost by definition has to be uh, an edge that flows in both directions. And so directed and undirected edges are different kinds of edges. And of course, uh, it could be that the weight or the thickness, the strength of the edge is different. Maybe you do give me rights to the airport, but I've given you 10 for every one. And so we might represent that by the strength of the edge. And there might even just be different kinds of edges all mixed together. Like there's rides to airport and dinners at my house. Uh, two different kinds of relationships, and we're going to mix them together. So what we're interested in is the capacity of the Internet to provide us with machine-readable edges that represent relationship information about entities. Often those entities are people. So when we look at the landscape of social media, and this is, of course, a very partial list, uh, but we are trying to pick off the bigger 
parts of the social media landscape that we're familiar with and build tools that make it really easy to extract the networks from these systems. How easy? Well, if you can make a pie chart. Uh, basically, we're going to give you a dialog box. You're going to type a few things in, click, and you're going to get data. Uh, and, and so we want to facilitate the ability of non-programmers to recognize that they may have access to data, or we can facilitate access to data that takes the form of an edge, in which essentially we're saying we have some entity A and an entity B, and we have some information about uh, the nature of their connection, or at least the existence of a connection, in the most fullness of uh, a data set. We might know things about the edge, like when it was, we might also know things about the vertex, like who it was and some attribute, attribute about them. Uh, maybe we know uh, what kind of job title they have or how many times we've seen them before. These are attributes of the people rather than the attributes of the relationship between them. Edges basically look like this. This is Node Excel, and you're looking at our edges worksheet and you're seeing our uh, representation of a network in the form of a spreadsheet in Excel. And there are some benefits to this. There are limitations, but there are also some benefits. Uh, uh, the benefit is that everything you know about Excel still works. So if you know how to make a formula, if you know how to sort a table, if you know how to export a pivot table, all of those wonderful things, if you can make a pie chart in Excel, you still can make a pie chart in Node Excel. Uh, Node Excel is Excel, it's just got more. Uh, so there we are, we're a menu up in uh, the ribbon, and we provide you with all of the tools you need to get data and do something to your data and visualize your data and export your data. And the most pivotal part of it is this, the Edges Worksheet. Somebody is to somebody else with a relationship at a date with some attributes. In this case, these are tweets pulled out of Twitter. So network theory turns out to be a really useful way for us to explore social media uh, because all social media is inherently a network even though different kinds of social media are different. Uh, Instagram is not YouTube and YouTube is not a wiki and wikis are not a blog and blogs are not email. Uh, they are different. But they all have the common feature of generating a network. And so network theory is now, what, 80 almost 90 years old. Uh, here's one of the first uh, public, um, you know, mainstream publications talking about network theory, the work of Jacob Moreno while at New York University in the early 1930s, starts developing these diagrams, drawing them by hand, looking at patterns and relationships between people. And, you know, th this does get applied in a lot of different places in industrial work relationships. It's very common to look at who works with who, who helps who in the workplace, who communicates with who in the workplace. There's a lot of interesting insights about the uh, functionality of groups and their structures, that some structures are better for certain kinds of tasks than others. Uh, so network theory is essentially the uh, application to the social landscape, what we know about uh, a lot of the concepts from the physical landscape. In real estate, we say that there are three most important things, um, a good foundation, uh, good local schools, and a low tax rate. Um, maybe not, no, I think it's just location, location, location. Uh, so your house has no abstract value. It really depends on where it is. Uh, in, in social media and in social networks, we don't really have location because there is no north, there is no south. Uh, what we have is near and far. It's a very relative concept of distance. Uh, and so what we have are the abilities to now grab social media. In this case, it's a bunch of tweets talking about Obama about a year ago. What we're able to do is turn these collections of connections, this stream of tweets, back into its latent structural properties. It has this data in the tweet stream. People do say the names of other people in their tweets. People do follow one another rather than everybody. Well, people make choices and they have a limited budget of connective resource. Uh, how many times can you retweet in a day? How many times can you mention somebody in a day? How many people can you follow? 
Uh, so because of this scarcity, this economy of connection, we find that some people are more connected than others. And so we can see in this structure a group of people who have, in fact, no connections. Uh, they talked about Obama, but they didn't talk to anybody else about Obama. Uh, but over here, we see people with many connections at the center and many peripheral people with just a few connections at the periphery uh, around this core. But we'll also note that there are two cores. And if you know anything about the United States, you'll recall that uh, the United States has two political parties, uh, a right-wing party and a far right-wing party. And what we're seeing here are the two clusters uh, of gr groups of people who, because of the phenomena of homophily, are more inclined to connect to the people they agree with than to the people that they do not agree with. And what we're seeing is the example or evidence of a, a pattern that we've identified uh, we call polarized, uh, the divided pattern. Two groups talking about the same thing, but they're not talking to each other. Uh, now, admittedly, there is some connection here, but we're talking statistically. There is uh, very little connection between these two groups by comparison to the amount of connection within these groups. And we'll see that this is one of actually a number. There are six different patterns that we can identify by using uh, a network analysis tool to collect many examples, now literally over a million examples. In the last three years, we've made hundreds or thousands of these a day. And after a while, certain patterns emerge, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So uh, I'm going to pause for just a second and see if there are questions. I'm going to toggle to the web page where there might be questions, and I'm going to see, uh, I see there is some here. So let me, uh, let me see if I can digest some of this and respond to it. Other spreadsheets, uh, it's a budget issue. Right now, no. Uh, our goal is to move to the web, uh, but you probably won't see us on the Mac or on OpenOffice until we get, um, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to need funding for that. I, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't have the resources. Um, let's see. Uh, what is the response, or how do the more traditional social, social scientists mediate between the reduction of social data? Um, well, I don't know if we're, if I'm going to argue about this reduction. Uh, I would say that this is a complement, too. Uh, you know, I was trained in ethnography. I believe in qualitative methods. I, I believe this is a constitution of the field, and that this is where the field work begins. This is just a better organization of the field. Uh, a tool for organizing the field. Uh, I don't think the work is done when we run Node Excel. In fact, I think the work begins. So I don't. I'll, I'll come back to that one, Christine. Uh, we'll see if I have addressed that for you. Um, let's see. Um, Yeah, uh, the I can't program. Well, actually, I encourage people who can't program to continue not programming because if you can program, then other people will make you program for them. Uh, and, and so it's a good uh, kind of ignorance to cultivate. I, for those who do have the skill, obviously, they're, they're, that's great. They're the mutants that are really adapted to this e ecosystem. Uh, and I mean that in a positive way. Uh, but I, I think what we need are better tools for the people who really can't bear the opportunity cost of learning Python right now. Um, and I think that can be done. And uh, so just like desktop publishing, I think we can really deliver many of the so-called big data, data science uh, workflows, and we can make that simple enough that everybody else can use them. And then we can get back to the business of actually telling the stories about what the data means. Okay. Uh, Ian, can you keep an eye on this for me so that I can, uh, I'm going to switch back, and if there are some uh, pressing questions, will you alert me to them? And, and I'll take silence yeah, as a good that's absolutely yes. fine. I mean, I'm, I'm oh, contributing. Oh. There's, some, there's a good dialogue going on in the in the hackpad. Um, if anyone, I'll, I'll send the link to the hackpad again if anyone would like to join in. There's a good, uh, we find this a really interesting uh, way of, of, of posting thoughts and, and having people on the webinar participate and answer. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of keeping an eye on the, uh, on the, uh, on the hackpad. And if you want to come back from sure. time to time, that's absolutely perfect. Very good. I, I'll, I'll make sure that we do get a, uh, a review of this before the end of our talk today. So um, for those who want to follow along, uh, you're welcome to visit us at nodexl.codeplex.com and download us there. 
Uh, there's a big upgrade coming in about a week. Uh, so if you haven't gotten it yet, maybe wait a week because it'll be easier that way. But if you have gotten it, come and get this one, and a new one's coming in about a week's time. Uh, the big news is that we will, after the upgrade, uh, we will now have auto-update. We're, we're excited about that. So you'll never have to upgrade us again. Uh, we do upgrade a lot. Uh, it's also worth taking a look at the site nodexlgraphgallery.org. Uh, this is a place where many of our users are storing uh, their data sets. They're posting their data sets here. You can see a large variety and styles and sophistication of network diagrams here. And importantly, each of these is actually the gateway to uh, a deeper view. So let's go pick one. Um, I'm going to go find one that I can tell a good story about. Uh, so here, for example, uh, the most recent map about the Sun Belt Conference. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this annual event. Uh, it is the gathering of the social network analysis community. Uh, so here, when you click in Graph Gallery, you're going to get a picture of the network visualization. These are the set of people who tweeted the term Sunbelt 2014 over a period of time that was about a week uh, period from the 16th through the 23rd. And there's 176 people here. They all tweeted this particular phrase, but some people said each other's names. They replied or mentioned to one another. And that formed a network. And that network could then be clustered. And you can see G1, G2, G3, and so on. Uh, these different sub-regions are essentially clusters uh, as discovered by um, here. One of the three algorithms that we've implemented, the Closet Newman Moore algorithm. That may be Clause A Newman Moore, so my apologies to Mr. Closet. Uh, and of course, we then lay it out using the Harold Karin fast multi scale layout algorithm. So within the boxes, it's Harold Karin. And this boxing uh, process, this is what we call the group in a box layout. It's worth noting that Node Excel also generates this report. Uh, every scientific image really ought to have a caption, and that caption ought to answer the questions that I think any interested observer would have. The when of the data, the what of the data, the size of the data, all of the measures a network analyst would want to know, the vertex count, the edge count, the number of edges that do have duplicate connections between people, the density of the graph, the modularity of the graph, all of these are uh, uh, maybe unfamiliar but are really the core social network metrics for any graph we include that automatically in any graph that you produce uh, if you flip that switch in Node Excel. But we then try to report to you all of the things that we think are likely to be the kinds of things that you're going to want to know about your graph, like who are the people at the top of the between the centrality distribution. And here are the people who Arguments could be made are the influential people in the community, and if anybody knows the social network community, uh, finding out that Barry Wellman is a highly central person um, it is a lot like discovering that the sun rises in the east, but uh, it is comforting because uh, Barry very much is the center of that community. Here he is in group three, his own group. So we also report a content analysis, essentially uh, chewing through all of the messages that you might have gotten from Facebook or YouTube. In this case, they're tweets, so we got them from Twitter. And as you know, social media is often um, studded with URLs, URLs and hashtags and at names, the three special kinds of textual objects that you're likely to find in a tweet. Uh, and, of course, the third thing being just words, uh, any string that's delimited by spaces. So we report about those four things. We'll tell you about the top URLs in your graph and then break that out by group. Each group has its own ranking of URLs and of the domains they link to. Uh, we then report what the top hashtags are as mentioned 
in the entire network. And again, repeat that information for each of the groups, actually at least the top 10 groups. We do that again for words, and then do it again for word pairs. So these are frequently co-occurring terms. These are the words that showed up a lot together. And as you can see that different groups are using different word pairs because each of these different groups are essentially talking about the event, this conference that happened about a week ago in Florida, uh, in a different way until we get to group eight when we realize that Sunbelt is also the name of a football conference in uh, Georgia and that these people are essentially not part of our community. Here it is. Uh, they're talking about football and they have no connections to the rest of the group. Uh, and that suggests that, that, that we're both using the same term, but we're using it in different ways. So what I'd like to do is uh, walk you through some of the interface and talk about what we're likely to find. And then uh, maybe what you could do is on the hackpad, nominate a topic, a hashtag, a URL, a query term, a username, and, in the, and we'll go and make that map uh, together in this webinar. So uh, let me describe a little bit about the, the motivations of Node Excel. Uh, you may be familiar with many of the other very fine quality social network tools out there. I'm thinking in particular of uh, Jeffy or Geffy. Uh, it certainly produces what I think are the most beautiful graphs out there right now. And their motto is that they are the Photoshop of graphs. And uh, we appreciate that. We respect that. Uh, we also have a motto, and ours is that we are the MS Paint of graphs. Uh, it is our intent to be the simplest, easiest, and most automatic possible tool for network analysis. And so um, I was going to say, so easy that you don't need to read a book, but of course we went out and wrote one. There are my co-authors, Derek Hansen. He's now at Brigham Young University, and there in the middle, that's Ben Schneiderman, who has for many, many years been at the University of Maryland in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, that's me in the lower corner. Uh, and that, of course, followed on this breakout bestseller from many years back with uh, now my sadly uh, late co-author Peter Colick. But here we go. Uh, let's talk about network analysis. Uh, we think that anybody who is going to do a network analysis task is going to walk through these five steps and if we're right, and these are the right five steps for you, then we have the good news that these steps can happen automatically. In fact, while I'm standing here speaking with you, there are several computers here and in the cloud, and every few minutes they wake up and they collect some social media data uh, from a variety of endpoints, and they run through a process of analysis and visual visualization, and then even automatically publication. And so, this process, if you want to go through this process, is now a pretty much automatic process. Uh, it can also be traversed in a manual way, and that's fine, but I think once you do it a few times, uh, you come to uh, value the ability to set Node Excel loose on 100 or 1,000 graphs and let it do what you would have done, uh, but it'll do it without um, taking up your time. So uh, let's talk about these five steps. The first thing is, of course, how do I get to some social media network data? And I should, should say that we also import data from the Gephi file format, the UCINet file format, the PIAC file format. We eat CSV and matrices. So lots of ways to get data in. Uh, I would argue if you can get your data into Excel, uh, then you can get it into Node Excel. And if you can't get your data into Excel, it probably isn't your data. So um, let's talk about importers. Uh, there's a lot of different sources of social media, and by extension, social media networks, out there on the internet. And so we don't consume them all. Uh, I mean, for example, there is that site known as Sino Weibo. Uh, there are 385 million people using that service. We do not support access to Sino Weibo. Not that we're not interested in it, but I, I just want to respect the idea that we, we have not exhaustively made it possible to uh, access all networks from all forms of social media. And no doubt you'll note a kind of North American and Silicon Valley focus here. Uh, but we do have an architecture that allows for the extension of these importers. And I'll even point to the imminent arrival of the V-Contacta 
uh, I probably said that wrong. Uh, the, the Russian social media network platform will have an importer for that very soon. And um, we're, we just recently added the media wiki importer. We also keep upgrading our Facebook importer. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, we're very eager to build those bridges, but we have not by any means built bridges to everything. But for the things that we have built bridges to, it's about as easy as clicking a button to get a social media network about any hashtag or URL or keyword or user from any of these various services. And we're interested in hearing about other services that are interesting enough to researchers to, to warrant the effort to build a connection. So then, okay, you got some network data. Uh, the question then becomes, well, where do you put it? Uh, what are you going to do with it? And for us, the answer is um, we're, we're going to put it in a workbook for you. And that means that the data is there, it's under your fingertips, you have a lot of control over it. And we do provide a variety of tools that then allow you to browse it, report on it, visualize it, interact with it, filter it. That's all here. Uh, but our goal is, first and foremost, to automatically get you your data and run it through this process so you can have an end result without really having any effort. Um, uh, one thing I like about the system is that it's continuously emailing me reports that look something like this, or basically it looks like what you saw in Graph Gallery. Uh, it emails those reports to me pretty much every 15 minutes for hundreds of topics that I'm interested in. So I get a aerial overview, if you will, of the structure of conversations rather than having to read thousands upon thousands of tweets. Here you're seeing the structure of a conversation uh, that surrounds people who mention uh, Gates Foundation, uh, the large health and wellness uh, nonprofit in Seattle. And then, of course, we have to do something with your data. We're going to have to analyze it. We're going to have to calculate the range of social network metrics, which we do. Uh, we, we do not have every metric. There are no doubt many that are missing. But we have tried to identify the 80% case, the set of network metrics that are pretty much used everywhere. And as with our data importers, we're certainly open to hearing from people who feel that uh, a missing one is critical to their work. And you know, over time, we have added some. We added PageRank over time. People said, you really can't call yourself a network tool without PageRank. So we added that. But if it's missing, let us know. But we think we've got most of the basic metrics that are useful for summarizing the shape of a graph as a whole and the location of any particular vertex within it. So then the goal is to tell your story. It's not just the numbers. It's going to be, we think, uh, pictures and numbers. And so making these kinds of graphs is now essentially an automatic process. Uh, with the input from many talented computer science researchers, we are applying uh, multiple steps to prep the graph so that layout algorithms like Fruchterman, Ryan Gold, and Harold Karin uh, essentially avoid their failure conditions. Uh, I would argue that both of them, for example, do a very, very bad job of separating clusters and handling isolates. Uh, you see here in this image off to the left side, any vertex that has zero connections, it essentially only connects to itself, it gets specially handled. We just line them up in a grid, grid and put them in their own box. Um, that's because in Harold Karin, they would all line up on top of the, themselves because they'd all share the same structural position, which is no structural position. And in Fruchterman and Rangold, they would uh, appear in a structure I would call the asteroid belt. They would become this big circle. Uh, this swarm around the edges of the graph because they have no connections to pull them into the center of the graph. So uh, we, we would argue that uh, this is a better handling. So meta visualization has been the main focus. And the goal is to let the tool generate a graph entirely automatically with zero human seconds, uh, a graph that is then no doubt in a condition to be improved, but potentially good enough for your daily diet of let me see the graph about my topics that I care about. So um, a graph that has an insight uh, that is not shared is not an insight. And so we want to facilitate the idea that you are going to want to show your network graph and the report about it to someone else. 
And then that brings us back to the Node Excel Graph Gallery at nodeexcelgraphgallery.org, where you can create a free account, you can download Node Excel, get some data of your own, uh, and very quickly upload an image and a report to share your data with others. It's also worth noting that you can find lots of people's data here for you to download, and particularly for access to historical data, that can be very useful. If you forgot to get data last year, it may be that one of your colleagues already got it for you. So uh, what good is it? We've gone to an enormous amount of effort to get data, store it, analyze it, visualize it, publish it. What, what kinds of stories can we tell? And I'm going to argue that there are many, but at least these. We're going to identify who is the mayor of your hashtag. We're going to identify the high centrality people. We're also going to cluster the graph, and we're going to identify what subgroups, if any, exist. And because we're interested in the network structure, we're going to be able to identify the few people, relatively few people, who bridge those clusters, who bridge the gap. So we're going to look for certain shapes. We're going to look at our networks, and we're going to look for certain kinds of patterns. And certainly one of those patterns is going to be the hub. Hubs are important. They've got a lot of connections. They're at the center of things in a lot of different ways. Um, but network theory is powerful because it can find people who, for example, might have far fewer connections, but whose connections are remarkably valuable uh, because they're unique. So in, in what way could someone have just two connections and have those connections be more valuable than someone who has 200? And the answer, of course, would be that those connections might be the only bridge between two otherwise very distant points. Um, that's my bridge. Come and visit our bridge. Um, 75 years old, the bridge. Uh, before the bridge was there, it took uh, 135 more miles to get from here to there, or you had to take the ferry. Um, with the bridge, it brings these two points much closer together. And so we want to find people who are bridges because they're important, and network theory lets us do that. But we're also going to look for people who have no connections, because it turns out that islands or isolates are also structurally important. Depends on your goal. They are not the center of the conversation. They are the periphery of the conversation, or they're not even yet the periphery of the conversation. Uh, the great thing about islands, though, is that they can be, uh, you can build a bridge to them. And so if you're looking to build an audience, islands are very important. Most people don't seem to want to talk about the islands. Uh, but we also can look up a level. We're not just looking at the positions of individuals. We're looking at the shape of the crowd. We want to look at clusters. We want to look at crowds. And we want to be able to see, as Mr. Obama is pointing here at his uh, tweet stream, that's the Obama tweet stream, uh, no doubt when he looks at a crowd, he gets a lot of information. He gets uh, a wealth of data about the size, shape, and the mood, uh, the attitudes and the divisions of the crowd he is physically in front of. Uh, but I believe this is when he was calling for increased federal funding for social media research. Maybe not. Uh, but that's the Obama tweet stream. And as we've seen before, it, it could be argued that it does damage to the underlying structure. It certainly does not reveal the underlying structure of social media. It doesn't show us the crowd. It shows us as if that crowd had been required to line up single file. And so is the top tweet the most important tweet? No, it's merely the most recent tweet. And so this is, again, uh, this is an Obama tweet stream. This is when uh, his State of the Union address was being delivered. And we can see that the, the social media crowd is actually a divided crowd and that it divides very much along ideological lines. We, we have made it easy to tell here red and blue. But you can tell by looking at the hashtags. Those are the words at the top of the boxes. Those are the 10 most frequently used words, uh, I'm sorry, hashtags in this case, used by the people in that box, in that cluster. And we can see that there is a clear divergence in the use of hashtags between these groups. So the, these are the kinds of low-level patterns and middle-level patterns that we're going to look for. And what we find is that people have their own kinds of patterns and groups, whole networks, have their own kinds of patterns that Different positions in the graph really matter. We're going to look for different people in different positions. We're going to look for the shapes that emerge in these graphs. And I think that we can find very different shapes that different kinds of topics 
form different patterns. And as we explored this, we found that we could actually identify six distinct patterns that showed up regularly in social media, and those were these. These were six kinds of Twitter social media networks. And I will just uh, drop out to a browser here and note that you can find this work now published with uh, Pew Internet. Uh, there they are. Uh, the Pew Report is one that um, summarizes this work, talks about the network patterns that we found, and reports all the data, as you see, right? Let's see if I can dial that up. Here's the complete report and the data gallery and a guide to how we did it. Uh, here is the complete report, uh, and it's a big one. Uh, and you'll find that we'll identify each of the six different patterns and provide a description of them, as I will now just in a few slides. Uh, so there are six patterns. Uh, we're not saying that there are not seven. We just haven't found seven or evidence of seven. We, we think that there are not five, that you cannot reduce these to each other. And so we would like to have a systematic study of social media such that we could identify eventually exhaustively how many different ways can people organize themselves and not just how many can they organize themselves, how many do, do they organize themselves into in social media. And we find these six divided, two groups, we've seen this a, a lot, polarized discussion. But we also find this, the opposite of polarized, unified, tight crowd, lots of people talking to each other, no division in the group. And that these patterns are quite different from these pair, the highly fragmented pattern. People talking about a brand, they're talking about iPhone, they're, they're talking uh, uh, about uh, thing, movies and TV shows, and they're mostly not talking to each other. But you know, sometimes those brands grow up and they do form these smaller clustered communities where people are talking to each other and there is some connection among them. Uh, but there's still a lot of this brand-like behavior. And then finally, these hub and spoke patterns, which look the same, but are in fact, uh, are in fact opposites of each other. Uh, here we have the broadcast pattern, uh, a little counterintuitive, but the broadcast pattern is one in which lots of people repeat what one person says. Why? Because that's usually a media person, a newspaper article, um, some very visible person, and they speak, and all of these people retweet them, forming an arrow from them to that center point. This is a very different pattern. It's the mirror pattern. Uh, it's the, this account responds to all of these spokes. And of course, the spokes don't connect to each other. That they share in common. These spokes do not connect to each other. This is essentially the audience. They, you know, the person you sit next to in the theater is not necessarily your friend. Uh, but you share a common interest in this hub. In this case, you only share the common uh, attribute of this account responded to you, and this would typically be a business uh, doing support. Uh, and I'll show you some examples. So here's the real world data that illustrates those patterns, the divided pattern, the pretty much everybody's connected to everybody pattern, the almost nobody's connected to anybody pattern, the some people are connected, but we still have a lot of fragmentation pattern, the in hub and spoke pattern, and here this is Dell listens, Dell cares, uh, the out hub and spoke pattern. We can look at those a little bit uh, closer. So this is people talking about tax policy in the United States. They don't agree. But don't, not only don't they agree, uh, they don't really talk to each other. And in the report you'll see that we analyze the words they use, the word pairs they use, the hashtags they use, and in particular the URLs they use. And so the question we ask is, of the URLs these people mention, and the URLs that these people mention, what percentage of those URLs are the same URLs? And the answer is zero. These people do not even point out at the world at the same objects. They're not talking about the same newspaper articles, even though they're talking about the same topic, in this case, my 2 k the 2,000 US dollars that the, a change in the tax policy would hurt, hurt or help each household. Uh, they have a divided opinion. They don't even talk about the same articles about that. So that's polarized. 
completely different from people talking about being social media managers, the community manager chat discussion. Almost everybody's connected to everybody in community manager chat. Uh, there really isn't an out group. There are some differences in interest. Uh, there is some density that creates clusters, but these are not divided clusters. This is an in-group. And this pattern has a lot of density by comparison to a brand. Uh, these people are talking about a mobile phone called Lumia, the Microsoft Nokia mobile phone. And for the most part, they have no connections. They're isolates, they're islands. And so there are these small clusters over here, but for the most part, more than half of the population have no connections to each other at all. They, they talk about Lumia, but they don't talk to each other about Lumia. Uh, in some cases, these brands grow up, and this becomes the bizarre, or we, we now call this the community clusters pattern. Um, this is people talking about the First Lady of the United States last year during her birthday. And there's lots of people talking about her, and they each have their own separate audience. The audiences tend not to be all that well connected to each other, but there's still brand-like behavior. So this is when the uh, brand-fragmented pattern grows up. It gets some community. But again, very, very different pattern from the broadcast pattern. Broadcast pattern is largely about retweeting a single person. In this case, it's Paul Krugman, the Nobel Prize winning economist and Princeton economics professor. He writes an article for the New York Times on Monday and Friday, and typically a lot of people are going to retweet that fella. And this is what it looks like. This is his audience. These people retweeted him, but they don't talk to each other. But these are his communities. These people talk to each other about what they retweeted from Paul Krugman, and this is the difference. These people have no connection to each other. These people do have connections to each other. This is the opposite of that pattern. This is the support pattern. In this case, almost all these arrows start here and end at the out point. This is Dell Cares telling you about how to resolve your customer support issues with Dell products. So what good is it? Um, social network analysis allow you, uh, methods allow you to ask a certain number of questions about social media, like what does your topic look like? And is that what you wanted it to look like? Uh, is there another topic that you aspire to be and, and what kind of network is that? And what is the difference between the current state of your network and the aspirational state you would like to achieve? And as you make some uh, strategic effort, how does your map change? What does your hashtag look like? Um, we think that asking these kinds of questions are useful ways of improving social media engagement because volume, two volumes of population uh, could be identical. And these two volumes, the same 10,000 people, let's say, can certainly construct very, very different social structures. And we believe that structure is destiny, that it really matters what shape these people form. It's not enough that you somehow attracted 10,000 people. It, you, you have to sort of make them connect in the right way. You, you have to cultivate the conditions that make them connect in the right way. So uh, we've been making a lot of these maps, and I'd like to make a few of them for you. Uh, you, you can see in Graph Gallery that Social media maps are not all the same, and I hope now that you've seen these six archetypes of networks that when you look at these, you'll say, ah, I see there's this pattern and that pattern, and uh, it's certainly the case that any real-world example might be a hybrid, a little of this and a little of that, but we think that these are six good ideal types for expressing the range of variation in social media networks of this sort. Uh, I, I should impose a caveat here. Uh, and that is, uh, th this is not to say that all social media networks look like this or have only these six structures. Um, we don't think that they all do, in fact. We, we're pretty sure that wikis, for example, don't have these patterns. But well, we do uh, think that... Uh, can, I just give you a, can I just give you a, a kind of couple of minute uh, time warning? We're coming up to, oh, yeah. coming up to five o'clock. I mean, I'm... I'm uh, I'm kind of fully engaged with what you're saying, but I don't know what I don't know what the other guys um, have got in time to. In we'll terms do a quick poll questions. and see if we can go uh, a few minutes extra, and, and uh, I, I will switch over and we'll we'll make this uh, uh, we'll focus from here on on uh, attendee questions. I, well, I, let me let me breeze through just really quickly 
uh, the work of others who are using NetExcel in their work. I, I want to say just a few names really quickly before I turn over the mic to our participants. Uh, this is the work of Katie Pierce, Professor of Communications at the University of Washington. Uh, she studies um, social movements in Azerbaijan and has been making network maps of hashtags used by protesters in Baku. Uh, often to good effect, she's able to detect, for example, uh, shill accounts created by uh, pro-government uh, people who created uh, many, many accounts in a three-minute window late one night. Of course, that was afternoon in Seattle, late one night in Baku. Uh, using this tool. Uh, I believe uh, Katie, uh, who is a very talented researcher, is not a programmer, so I'm very pleased that she's able to do this work. Uh, this is the work of Scott Dempwolf, now Dr. Dempwolf at uh, the University of Maryland. He's a business researcher, and he's been studying network connections created when people author patents together, and one of his observations is that there are regions of the country here in the United States, certainly in the world, um, in which uh, certain kinds of topics become innovation clusters. Certain kinds of innovations happen in certain places and not in others. This is research, of course, that he's able to do. Again, he's not a programmer. He's able to do it with Node Excel. Uh, one that I'm particularly fond of is the work in the digital humanities, work of Diane Klein, not uh, formerly of the University of Cincinnati, now at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., uh, Dr. Klein is a classics professor, studies the life and history of Alexander the Great, had uh, done this work for many decades, and is now, with a few clicks, generating a network map that is showing uh, new insight into the life of uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, apparently, Mr. the Great did not have a Facebook page, but he, he did have a social network. So with that, uh, let me drop out of this. And I'm going to turn to the uh, pack pad. And Ian, uh, could you prioritize these for us? And uh, oh, and you would like to make some uh, maps? Let's do that. I'm going to grab these three, and I'm going to make a map alongside our conversation. Uh, and I'll show you how I do it in just a moment. Here's Excel, and I'm going to create a new blank Node Excel workbook. Here's our graph pane, and here's the uh, spreadsheet. I'm going to go into the Node Excel menu, and I'm going to go to the Data Import menu. And right there, I'll see that there is a Twitter search network importer. I'm going to select that. I'm going to paste uh, Web Science or And that last one was website. Okay, so I'll take these and I'm going to or them. I'm actually going to drop the hashtags because I figure we are not likely to have a namespace collision. There are not an, there is not another group of people using that term. Uh, I've told it to go and get me as many tweets as it can. Uh, and there's all sorts of things to talk about limits on what Twitter will and will not give you. And you know, there's more will not than will. So. Uh, I'm going to click these boxes and say OK, and we're now going to collect tweets directly from Twitter, uh, getting first a page, 100 tweets at a time. We're going to go back and try to get up to 180 pages with a lot of caveats and limits, uh, one being that Twitter is uh, not going to give us any data that's more than a week old by policy, just not going to do it. It's not going to give us more than 18,000 tweets, and it's probably not going to give us 18,000 tweets uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, there may not be 18,000 website tweets in the last seven days. Uh, two, even if there were, uh, it often decides to deliver a mere few thousand at a time. And so here we've just gotten our data, uh, and you'll see that the edges worksheet are there. Uh, and you'll notice that I'm not doing anything here. This is the player piano quality of Node Excel. It's now running what we call automate. Automatically, automation kicked off, and it's now running an analysis. Um, running through each of the steps of analysis necessary, we think, to perform a proper analysis of social media. Uh, and I'll note that Node Excel uses the concept of option files. You might want to call them recipes. You could go to Graph Gallery, grab one of my graphs, grab the recipe 
from it. Go to this menu, the option menu, import that recipe, and then you could run automate on your graph and you would get the same results or at least the same style of results. So here we have now just grabbed a bucket full of tweets and we can see a network has formed. Uh, this is the network of people who reply or mention one another uh, and who is the leading between the centrality person uh, that would be Soten DE, and um, I assume that's your German. So, who, who is Soten DE? No, that's Digital Economy. That's uh, Southampton Digital Economy. It's probably Lisa Harris or somebody else in the uh, in the uh, digital economy space. There you go. And then uh, number two is Richard Gomer. Who's Richard? Yeah, he's not on the call, but he's a uh, he's uh, he's one of our web science uh, PhDs. Okay. Then Stefan Basen. Yeah, he's a, he's a researcher. Right, and you'll notice that we could um, tooltip and we see their latest tweet. We can click and we see their connections. Uh, he has a strong connection to Nigel. Uh, I'm going to right click and fire up the browser. I now go straight, straight to his page. I could follow him. I will follow him. Uh, and then I can see here just by sorting by between the centrality, and I did that just by using the you know regular Excel sort. Um, these are likely to be the most influential voices talking about these three topics: web science, web observatory, web sci. At least in the last seven days or so. Cool. Uh, I could now take this data and I'm going to publish it to the graph gallery. Uh, you'll notice that Node Excel wrote my report for me. I don't have to do that. I'm going to title it though and tell it that I want it to share the data and the graph ML and put it out at a standard size. So I like all my graphs to be roughly the same size. It, you can make it so that it, it takes the size and the shape of the screen and I don't do that. Uh, so now we've just gotten a graph, analyzed a graph, visualized a graph, built a report about a graph and then if all is well when we go not there when we go here, uh, we're going to go to Graph Gallery and click. We're going to come back to the top of the graph, and here is the website graph. Very and for cool. those of you out there, uh, if you come to the very bottom of the graph, you can see that there's the data. You can download it. And importantly, there's the recipe. You can import that recipe and then run Automate on your own data, and your data will at least look like this data. But I heard a question there. Ian, please go ahead. So there were a couple of questions, actually. Um, one I think you um, alluded to, which was um, how do you handle data sets collected from Twitter that can't be shared publicly? Um, ah, right. Um, let me show you that. And that would be, um, right, let's see here. Okay. Uh, this is our export menu. I use the export to Node Excel Graph Gallery to get it into the public view. Uh, of course, this is a workbook, and you could just email it, and that's fine. And you could do this. Uh, you can copy the image to a clipboard, and you can go to a document and paste it in there. You, you can even hit this button, the summary button. This is where that text report is. You can copy it to the clipboard. You can paste it somewhere. Uh, but you can also do this. Uh, I can go to the export menu, go to email, uh, and then I can build an email just stick uh, any email address here, and it will build a, uh, a report with ba basically a private email. It'll look like what you see in Graph Gallery, only it will travel as an email and only be visible to the people you send it to. Right. Does that address that question for you? Um, I guess I guess what with um, part of what's um, in the question there is whether or not you're you're moving around representations of the metadata only or the underlying tweets that. Twitter would generally not allow you to move around, right? You can, you can right, capture right, tweets, right. but you can't move the underlying tweets. Right, that, that is important. And when you do export it, you should remove this column, the tweet column. Right, okay. Right. So we've got, I think we've got a supplementary question coming in here. Someone's typing in the hackpad. Sure. Um, yeah, you should not redistribute the tweets. You should just okay. uh, delete column Q uh, oh, so before just, it goes off. 
Right. So we'll just we'll just um, we'll note if someone could just note as you're as you're typing there that we uh, that we would uh, generally delete the uh, delete the raw tweets from the uh, from the uh, right for public use. That's right. I mean, within your research group, I think you can email <laughs> them around and share them. Um, somebody else has asked, um, do, do we, uh, do we have the capability to resolve shortened, shortened URLs that are included? Very good in question. Yeah. Uh, yes. And it's an option, which I turned on here. Um, notice this bit right there, expand URLs in tweet and notice we, you know, we warn you, okay. uh, not that much slower. I mean, we, we just okay. saw it go. Uh, it really depends on the size of the data set. Some of these data sets can be much larger. Uh, and when I, uh, let me just explain, uh, expand URLs, we do a double unwrap, which is to say most URLs convert to t.co. Yeah. We, we resolve that. Uh, in many cases, that resolves to Bitly or Owly or, you know, take your pick. Right. And we resolve that. And so you will not get a bucket of Bitly you will get a bucket of, we believe, the, the underlying URLs. And you can find them here um, in this tab. This is the spreadsheet representation of what you see in uh, the, the text report. It shows up serialized. Here it's as a grid. But here they are. These are the top URLs and their ranking, and then broken out by group. Uh, not each of the groups will link to the same URL with the same frequency, or at all. Cool. Um, we have another question about um, whether you considered moving from a 2D representation of the networks to look at stuff to uh, that would capture depth. Um, well, yeah, yeah. There, there's a um, there's a good deal of uh, interest in 3D, but uh, we are lucky to have one uh, contributor to our team, uh, Ben Schneiderman. Uh, right. Professor Schneiderman is a renowned uh, contributor in information visualization. And, um, you know, we early on said, 3D, 3D, I want to see it spin. Uh, and Ben said, no. <laughs> no. And, and, you know, he then gave us a lot of principled reasons, and I, I'll share some of them with you. But uh, broadly, we ha he is not yet convinced uh, that given the cost, and it's not trivial, and it's not just computational and performance-wise, but cognitive, yeah. That it doesn't necessarily deliver much in the way of benefit. Hmm. Yeah, and so, I think that's a good cost. I think that's a good, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's a good point. Is you know, would it would it look cooler? Yes. Would it allow you to rotate around the, the data set? Yes. But uh, I guess the question is, what what does it give you cognitively? You know, maybe the, so, Christine who answered the question has got has got an example of where that uh, you know, where that would be uh, the case. Um, I would love to keep you on the line for another hour um going through this stuff because i think the i think the practical examples are particularly of interest to the people on the call you know actually right. resolving specific questions we, we should perhaps schedule another one where we dispense with all introduction and go straight to the click here click here click here discussion yeah, well, maybe you know maybe we can do that i mean let me ask a question are there are, is there um from the nodexo website is there are, are there um any tutorial videos or is there any YouTube material that we might want to follow up on with that or are we best to just book another uh, are we best to sort of book a hands-on workshop with you well you know I don't want to reduce the likelihood of getting another workshop with you so I'm, I'm going to declare bankruptcy there but the, the reality is no you, you can find quite a bit of content and I'll point you first here uh, to slideshare.net where you'll find essentially this slide deck you've seen and much more. Uh, there's quite a number of uh, pieces of material there uh, in other slide decks for different kinds of audiences, different themes, but this is the big one with the 95 slides overview. Uh, I'll also, of course, direct you to our website at nodexl.codeplex.com. Uh, in particular, the discussions tab is your friend. We will answer pretty much every a uh, question that we can understand, we will answer here in the message board often within a day. Uh, but I'll also point you to the documentation tab. And for the scholars in the room, uh, particularly the NodeXL teaching resources page, uh -huh. where you will find that there is a slide deck that contains the images present in each of the chapter of the book, the analyzing 
social media networks with Node.xl, Insights from the Connected World book. Uh, but you will also find all the data sets mentioned in the book. You will also find uh, classroom assignments and syllabi oh. that are now making use of Node Excel in the teaching of social media. And, and I should broaden that and say, really, the teaching of network science concepts, hmm. often social network science concepts, and in some cases, social media network concepts. So it does not, you know, I, I just want to make the case, this is not just about Twitter. This is about things that are connected to things. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be patents, could be the relationships of Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. uh, could be tweets, doesn't have to be. We see protein, protein networks, electrical networks, uh, investment networks, lots of networks. But we are the Social Media Research Foundation, and we are trying to make it be that uh, it's really, really easy now to study social media networks, and we provide you with access to Facebook and Exchange and Wikis and so on, but there's also these third-party importers, uh, the work of um, Robert Ackland, Professor Ackland at the Australian National University, his work on Voson gives Node.xl the ability to crawl the World Wide Web, and that includes blogs. Wow. Uh, this is the Exchange spigot, lets you crawl enterprise email networks. Uh, this is the social network importer for Node Excel. Don't call it the Facebook importer, uh, but that's what it does. Uh, we're just afraid of Facebook. Uh, this is the Wiki importer, uh, now a collaboration uh, with Brian Keegan at Northeastern University. I should note that the social network importer has been a uh, collaboration with Bernie Hogan at the Oxford Internet Institute, not far from you. Bernie gave one of so our. So lots of collaborations our, going on. Last year. I, I'm sorry, that was garbled for me. Can I ask you to repeat? So I say Bernie gave one of our, our webinars last year. We know Bernie, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a great guy and a good contributor to our project. So I would like to invite you all to upload your graphs to Graph Gallery. Uh, I'd love to see uh, the diversity of graphs. And you are also, of course, welcome to have a look at the graphs that I've been uploading largely from Twitter, but now increasingly looking at um, wikis and Facebook and uh, just starting with some YouTube. So maybe now that you've seen these different patterns, you'll see that you can recognize some of those patterns just by looking at these uh, recently uploaded graphs. And I'm just going to toggle back here, see if there are any others. Can I ask one last one last question, Mark? Your, your book, does it focus largely on the technical use of the tool or does it cover um, any of the theory around interpreting the structures that come back from the tool. Right, right, right. Um, it has been said that uh, the, the structure of the group, uh, I'm sorry, of the book is uh, like a tree. The roots, the first three chapters, are really uh, a broad introduction to social media and social networks. Right. Uh, the, the trunk is a series of chapters that are very hands-on and practical, I like to call those chapters the click here, click here chapters. Okay. Uh, and they show off many of the core features of Node Excel. But then there are the branches. And we have, I think, seven branches uh, in the book. And those branches are essentially, we, we call them the silo chapters, uh, one each for each of the major social media services that we were able to analyze at the time of writing the book. So there's the Flickr chapter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, wikis, blogs, uh, and email. And so each of those is a combination of theory, method, and data, looking very particularly at what can you know when you look at Flickr? What can you discover when you look at the networks in something like Facebook or YouTube? So um, I would say it's a mixture. Maybe that was a long answer to a short no, question. That's a great, that's a great answer. I, you know, I think that, um, I'm going to allow myself a selfish observation here, which there are on occasion presentations of social media networks, which I think are missing um, the so what. You know, we, we often see presentations of social, social data without any kind of uh, explanation of what it implies or what we can know from it. And I think it's very important that your that your book and your tool is is attempting to to resolve that issue that there is more to the analysis and there is more to the science than simply saying isn't this pretty or you know, look at 
look at these nodes. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm very pleased that you say that that you that you actually uh, you actually focus on the differences between the different networks and you know what what is knowable, which I think is a big issue for observatories. It's a big issue for websites in general that as we model, we need to be aware that these are models and not reality, and and, and be cautious of what we can know from a model. Indeed. Uh, so here you'll note in our Pew report, um, Pew is very keen to say uh, that we should say, uh, why does this matter? Yeah. You know, we, we really have to focus on what is the utility of this insight. And I would argue, as I do in this paper, um, that right now there are various crowds gathered in the squares and plazas of world capitals around this planet, and whenever a group of people in their thousands gather, uh, somebody thinks it's newsworthy, and they send a cameraman, they send a photographer. Uh, but as we speak, orders of magnitude, more people are gathered in the plazas and the squares of cyberspace, which essentially are the hashtags, the chat rooms, the, the web boards, uh, you know, the Facebook pages. These are the new plazas. But we haven't sent a photographer and so we would like to see this tool be thought of as essentially the first point-and-shoot digital camera for social media networks. I think, and I think what we I really want to see happen is. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go on. No, I was going to say I think I think that's a great I think that's a great summary. Um, um, I will thank everyone for attending this afternoon. It's always a good sign when the webinar runs over a little bit because it shows how interested people are. Um, everyone has stuck with us all the way through the presentation, which is which has been great. Um, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking Mark um, for the presentation. And I'll, what we'll do, I think, is 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 uh, discuss with you whether we need to follow up with with other, uh, you know, other follow ups to this, because I think there's a lot of mileage in this tool and there's a lot of a uh, lot of capability here that, uh, that everyone across the uh, the WISNET network could, could benefit from. So what we will do is um, we've, rec we've been recording the webinar. Um, if you give me a day or so, that will be transcoded and, and available from the network, uh, from, the, from the website. Um, so, Mark, thank you very much indeed. We look forward to, uh, to speaking with you again. Ian, thank you, and thanks to all of the folks who have gathered with us today. I appreciate the time. Hope to see you online. Uh, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help you over those first few bumps. Thanks a lot, and thanks to everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you.